The CompTIA Security Plus SY0701 practice questions that I published just the other day seemed to be a pretty popular video. However, the primary purpose was to make sure that everyone was aware of the new practice questions I just published on Udemy. I gave you guys a practice question in that video, but I'm sure that you're probably wanting some more. So here's another video with 10 more practice questions for the CompTIA Security Plus SY0701. Uh, my name is David Staples, and that's coming right up. So as I mentioned, we've got 10 more practice questions for the CompTIA Security Plus SY0-701 exam. Today is November 10th. That exam just came out three days ago, November 7th. Uh, so hopefully you find these helpful. If you're not familiar with my background, I've written thousands of practice questions for courses like the CompTIA Linux Plus and Security Plus and Cloud Plus and so on. So if you've taken any college courses using that particular courseware, I might have actually written your midterm or pop quizzes or your final exam even. But for this set, I'm coming directly to you guys with some practice questions. I'm going to put some links down in the description below. Be sure to check those out. If you've got any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments box down below. If you want to go ahead and click on that like button and then subscribe, that both helps me out with the algorithm as well as helps to make sure that you stay tuned for future videos. But without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and take a look at question one. So Jared manages a set of critical applications for the organization he works for. They are currently running in a single data center that the company owns. He is considering using a cloud service provider for a secondary location as a blank. So is that a cold site, a warm site, a mobile site, or a hot site? Now, some of you might know this answer right away. Others might need a moment to think about the answer. Uh, if you need a few moments to think, go ahead and hit that pause button now, because we're going to go ahead and keep on talking here so there's not a big 30-second silence while we wait for everyone to come up with the, uh, the right answer here. And we'll kind of follow that same premise throughout these other questions as well. So we know that when we're looking at using a cloud service provider that those are pretty much an always-on type scenario, right? It's not just a big empty building. It's not going to be a, a warm site where it's going to potentially take us days. We can have everything backed up to the cloud and have it basically as a hot site so that we can very easily fail over to it. In fact, we might even actually use it as an active-active scenario would be an even better solution. An active-active, if you're not familiar, is where we have our on-premises data center always online. And we are also using a uh, cloud service provider and have that always online. And we basically split the traffic between the two. If anything ever goes down at either location, we simply fail the traffic over to the one that is still online. But in this case, we said that we are looking for a hot site. That is going to be D. So hopefully everyone did well there. Let's go ahead and keep on moving on along to question number two. Like I said, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments below. But question number two. Gordon has just received a copy of a document that details a list of possible scenarios that could happen to the organization, along with what the impact and cost could be if any of those scenarios were to occur. Which of the following is most likely the document he received? Is this a vulnerabilities inventory, a risk register, a weaknesses and threats chart, or a negative potential chart? So again, if you need a few moments to think about the answer, certainly feel free to hit that pause button. And we're going to go ahead and continue on with discussing the answer right now. So when we're talking about the list of different vulnerabilities, the things that our organization could face, and the negative impacts and the uh, quantifying those, uh, that's going to be our risk register. So hopefully everybody's familiar with the concepts of how we deal with risk in an enterprise, but we are going to be looking for B, our risk register here. So let's go ahead and move on to question number three. Selena has just joined an organization as a new employee. As part of the new hire paperwork, she has presented a document that informs her that all computer, network, and phone usage in the organization is monitored and outlines what type of activity are not allowed using company resources. Which of the following was she asked to sign? So here we're going to be looking at some documents and policies, right? So is this a, an NDA, an AUP, an SLA, or a BCP? So again, if you need to pause for a moment and think about this, if you're not familiar with these acronyms, probably a good time to start learning some of these acronyms. But we're going to go ahead and continue on discussing the answer. So if you need to take advantage of that pause button, now would be the time. But these acronyms are a non-disclosure agreement, an acceptable usage policy, a service level agreement, or a business continuity plan. Well, when we look at the acceptable usage policy, that is describing exactly what the, the question is asking for. So this is going to be B. Selena has been asked to sign an acceptable usage policy. So let's go ahead and move on to question number four. Greta has just joined a freight shipping company as a new systems administrator. She starts browsing through one of the dashboards available to her to get acquainted with the systems 
and sees a metric called MTBF. Which of the following is likely to be what she is looking at? Is this going to be mode time between failures? Is it going to be maximum time between failures? Minimum time between failures? Or mean time between failures? Which of the four of these do you think that might be? So again, if you need to take advantage of the pause button, now would be the time because we're going to go ahead and discuss the answer. Uh, mean time between failures is going to be what we are looking here. It's the average amount of time uh, that a system is going to be up before we can expect another failure within the same category device. So for instance, if I'm looking at hard drives, if I've got you know, 100,000 hard drives in my organization uh, and we have a, you know, a very specific model or so, uh, we're typically looking at what's the mean time between failures for that specific hard drive and maybe uh, should I look at a different model of hard drive if that time is not long enough. Come. So let's go ahead and keep on moving on to question number five. Brianna is required to use a retinal scanner in order to gain access to the data center that she works at. Which of the following factors of authentication have been employed by this organization? So here we're making sure that you know the different factors of authentication. Is this something you are, something you have, something you know, or somewhere you are? So again, if you need that pause button, now would be the time. But when we're talking about a retinal scanner, that is going to be something that you are. Biometrics describe using you know, retinal scanners, iris cameras, voice recognition, uh, facial recognition, fingerprint readers, palm uh, geometry scanners, all sorts of different things there. So moving on to question number six. Josh has just started a career in cybersecurity. He was astounded that there's a database online where he can easily search for the weaknesses that exist in different applications his company uses. Which of the following best describes this resource? Is this going to be an SCAP, an SIEM, a CVE, or a DLP? Hopefully everybody is familiar with these concepts and what these acronyms are, what they mean. So if you need to use the pause button to think about it for a few more moments, certainly feel free. But we're going to go ahead and answer the question now. So in this case, we're looking for the CVE, or Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. You might also see this in the CompTIA objectives as the Common Vulnerabilities and Enumerations. Uh, but there is a database out there called CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, that has the registered mark on it. So I'd imagine perhaps that's why CompTIA calls it Enumerations instead. But we are looking for answer C here. So question number seven. Janelle has just started working for an organization as a systems administrator. As part of a job, she needs to be reachable by phone. At her last company, she was forbidden from using her company-provided phone for personal use. At this new company, they seem to have thrown that concept out the window. Which of the following best describes the policy adopted by the company she now works for? Is that BAPP, BYOD, CHAP, or COPE? Again, if you need a moment to think about this, feel free to use that pause button, but we're going to go ahead and answer the question now. So we are looking for corporate owned, personally enabled here. This is not a bring your own device. I made up the BAPP acronym uh, and then CHAP, this is the Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. It has absolutely nothing to do with smartphones in the enterprise. So this is going to be D, COPE. So moving on to question number eight, Francis has chosen an Amazon DynamoDB database for the backend database of the application he is developing. When the database is not being accessed, what term could be used to describe this backend resource? Is this data at rest, data in use, data in vitro, or data in transit? So if you need a moment to think about it, use that pause button, but we're gonna go ahead and show the answer here that data being stored in a DynamoDB database is gonna be considered data at rest. Now, when it's moving over the network, that's gonna be data in transit. Uh, data in use is typically in memory or in a CPU cache somewhere. Uh, data in vitro, I just made up that term. So this is going to be A, data at rest. So question number nine, Han has just joined an organization as a systems administrator at a manufacturing company. As part of the tour of the plant, he has shown several systems running Windows NT 4.0 due to some legacy software running on these systems. Which of the following would be the best method to secure these systems? Is that going to be UTM, NGFW, air gapping, or SCADA. So if, again, if you need a moment to pause and think about this, use that pause button. But we're going to go ahead and discuss the answer now. So this is not unified threat management. It's not a next generation firewall, and it's not going to be SCADA. This is going to be air gapping, where we're essentially saying that there is not a physical connection between this server and the rest of the network. Now, 
that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a physical wire when we're talking about air gapping. This is also saying that we're also not going to use a Wi-Fi network connection with that server as well. So there is no network connection whatsoever for this server. So this is going to be air gapping. That is C. So let's go ahead and move to our question number 10. Which of the following categories of controls best classifies a man trap? So say logical control, a physical control, an administrative control, or managerial control. So if you need to use that pause button, now would be the time, but we're going to go ahead and discuss that answer now. So a man trap is a physical device where you walk in one door, it locks behind you, and then the second door unlocks and you can then go into whatever the area is. Typically a lot of these are monitored by video or they're watching through glass or, or whatever, but you cannot enter the area that you're trying to get to or without the entryway behind you becoming secure first. So that is going to be a physical control. So I hope you found these 10 practice questions for the CompTIA Security Plus SY0701 helpful. Again, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave those down in the comments below. Uh, be sure to check out the description of the video for the link to the set of practice questions that I just published on Udemy just uh, within the last week. If you haven't liked the video already, be sure to click on that like button and click on subscribe to make sure that you stay tuned to future videos just like this and perhaps other related technologies such as the AWS Cloud Technology Series that I'm working on right now as well. I certainly appreciate you watching. You guys take care and we will see you soon. Thank you.